Welcome to the Guy and Cody's Cult Cinema Cast. I'm Kyle. I'm Cody. And this is a bad movie. Should that be our new catchphrase? I kind of, I kind of like it. Yeah, I could be used to that. I don't know. It, it's in theory a bad movie, and on top of that, one of the most uh, critically acclaimed movies that we've ever done, apparently. No, I, I people don't. A lot of, they, I don't know, what does it have on... We do this sometimes. Let's look at what it has on. Oh, the, it, it, it's probably really stupid. Um, it's seventy-two on Rotten Tomatoes, which isn't the worst. Uh, Seven point four on IMDb. On Metacritic. Yeah, that's. I get that. Um, probably should be lower though, but it's not like. Uh, we're not the only ones that don't like this. I went to this, and I, I my friends dragged me to the theater for this, and uh, I was. Uh, unsatisfied with it and they were pretty upset with me for not liking it honestly <laughs> it was funny winning two three awards across the table out of i think of a white one two three four five six twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty twenty one um nominations Across the board, I guess. Okay, that's... I assume that's, like, for lots of different shows or whatever. Yeah, lots of different accolades. Oh, yeah. That's what I meant by across the board. So that's including, like, uh, the Teen Choice Awards, the Critics' Choice Awards, Visual Flex Society Awards, uh, Satellite Awards, BAFTA Awards. It got one Academy nod for Best Visual Effects. Yeah, but it didn't uh, win. So, what won that year? Uh, best visual effects. It lost to First Man, which is about Neil Armstrong. Never heard of that movie. Yeah. Oh, weird. I heard of that movie. Yeah, we're doing Ready Player One this week um, as like the finale to our sub theme of movies, uh, books that never should have been made into movies. Because the book is, I, I, I get, I read the book pretty bad, pretty bad. I did not care for it. There were parts that were good, just didn't like the whole thing. Yeah, the book is like, it changes a lot of things, which we'll get into, but that's not really the issue. They didn't like improve. There's maybe one improvement to the movie over the book, but uh, yeah, I don't, it's didn't. The book didn't, uh, wasn't the best. There were parts of it, like, again, that I liked, but, uh, the, which is another thing. The book, the movie takes away parts of the book that I like, which is another problem. Like, there's, uh, this is a very much more an action movie where the book is, like, uh, very much like people are thinking through the challenges, um, with, like, a couple, like, uh, Wade, like the main character Wade being involved in maybe a couple fight scenes um, that aren't like usually described like very in depth, which is a problem with the book, but I don't want them to take away like the thinking, like the puzzle solving that they do in the in the novel. The premise to Ready Player One, because uh, we should explain that, is uh, in the near future. This guy, James Halliday, and uh, his business part, part, partner, uh, uh, Ogden, Ogden, Ogden Moro, Moro, Ogden Moro, Ogden Moro, Ogden Moro. Names are bad. Why does he have such a read name? Um, it doesn't help that I want to, every time I hear the name Moro, I want to say, uh, like, T.O. Moro from DC Comics. Um, and also, his, like, sh they shorten his name to Og. So I think it's Ogden, yeah, Ogden Moro is his name, is how that works. Uh, but they release a really fancy VR metaverse MMO thing, and it becomes like just the biggest thing in the universe. And uh, when Halliday dies uh, after uh, expelling or like having Ogden uh, sign sign his way out of the company, Og. Uh, Halliday makes a big Easter egg hunt that um, if you find if you uh, find the eggs in the game or you find the egg in the game after like solving a bunch of other riddles, you get to be in control of the uh, 
the video game metaverse thing, which is called the Oasis, and which is at this point like the biggest thing in the unit in the world. Like he would be the rich. It would it makes you the richest man on earth if you own it. The draw to this is that oh, it's a video game world, and you're like jumping through a bunch of like uh, fancy like references to stuff you can play as like make up a bunch of like pop pop culture references and you can like play as them but um the issue like the the draw is like oh it's a cool video game world and you want to like immerse yourself in the cool video game world a difficulty which is hampered by the fact that um the video game the oasis uh sucks like, they describe it, and it is just, like, the most miserable fucking thing I've ever heard. Um, the movie's not as bad for that, but the book is especially, like, this is a terrible video game. It is, like, entirely, you need to pay money to, like, play in it and, like, get anywhere. Like, the first, um, for the first little bit of the book... He's just, uh, Wade is just like, he cannot leave the planet because he can't afford, like, train money, essentially, to fast travel off the planet onto, like, any of the other cool worlds, which is, um, not the case in this. They make, they make a point of, like, saying, like, oh, yeah, he doesn't have a lot of money at the beginning, but, um, in the book, it's just so much worse. It's like, you, his, his lack of money just, like, makes him like unable to do anything like he's able to like grind to like level three which is um it's not entirely clear i think it's like the level cap in this is a hundred um which is what people can get to i think it's uh common to get to 40 but the other which um is another thing you grind to get your levels but this but this game um this game which is the most popular game in the world and is like encompassed all other games is a hardcore PVP MMO which are famously uh like people clamor for them but a lot of people don't really care for them cuz you die and you lose all a hardcore PVP MMO for those of you who don't know is one is a massive multiplayer game which uh focuses on you eventually fighting other players um, and if you di- and the hardcore part is, is if you lose or die, you lose all your stuff. So, mm-hmm. yeah, and like stuff that these people are buying with real money. So, like even in the movie, it, like it's clarified that like, there's there's like gambling involved in all this, like real money gambling, essentially. So it's just like they describe to you just like the worst video game ever where like you need to like grind like at least in the movie you can like infer that like wade did some grinding and managed to like pay for that uh delorean he has in the movie um in the in the book he just like does not get anything until after he gets the uh first key for the easter egg hunt which is wisely something they maybe left out of the movie yeah, or that they changed for the movie. Like, yeah, it does some some stuff for, uh, like, like tension, I guess. But it does make like, the world more fun. Yeah, but I, I feel like that the, the, there's a giant drawback is is the fact that the, uh, the movie doesn't quite, frankly, encompass just how much people's money is actually tied up in the in this uh in this game. People go out and they they get a job to pay basically for. No, no, because in in the yeah. books the currency is actually changed from uh, real life money to IOI currency or uh, Oasis currency. Also, in the movie, they do um, have the one part where uh, they point out that his uh, step that Wade's step uncle blows all their uh, money at like a at, at a game. So like all their real life money. So that's an important thing. To, mm-hmm. uh, so like it is clarified, like people are like wasting all their real money on this. And like no one can play like a different game at all in this. 
So it's a little it, like, OK, it's a little unbelievable that any like really any game would get to this level of popularity. But that's like, OK, you're kind of you're skipping past that for the sake of uh, uh, the premise of the movie, which is fine. Um, but yeah, it just it, it they don't describe a fun game, which is the other part. And like it's also like set in like this dystopian future where like global warming's fucked everything and like everyone and like uh wade he lives in these uh essentially it's like mobile homes that are like inserted into these um metal like scaffolding and they're like super like unstable so like they fall over occasionally and just like like a couple hundred people die every time this happens and like this is like sort of a norm for a lot of people and it's pointed out in the movie that like video like in the like in the book and the movie that like global warming's fucked everything there's been like a lot of riots and like in, even in the movie they just straight up say people stop trying to solve their problems and like i'm supposed to like immerse myself in this world as like a big fun happy time which is what i think a lot of the draw for this is like this is dour like just and like stuff that like i'm not convinced like some of this stuff won't become a thing oh no uh, i fucking the worst part about it is like facebook with like you mentioned the meta earlier and yeah like... no i i said metaverse because we because since we since this book was written this book was written in 2011 we've invented a term for what they're describing in this book because like we're on the cusp of actually creating it because we live in the fucking cyberpunk i, I feel like and it sucks <laughs> i feel like mark zuckerberg like like watched this movie or like read the book into himself and just got like straight up erect over the idea of fucking making the oasis in real life and that, that's why he's really heavily pushing for it at and, and we know what's going to suck uh, is the other thing <laughs> like we know it's going to suck and it's just <laughs> like it's not a fun premise anymore just like and it's just made purposely just like i think i was like i we did like a whole thing where like we we have like a group chat with some friends and i was like saying in my group chat like look this is just like possibly prophetic because like i'm not convinced that like elon musk isn't gonna buy ea and just make like the worst video game ever that like we all have to play like that's not out off the table like is that off the table? Also, can we like argue that EA remote? already already made the worst game we've ever played? Yeah, but you don't have to play it as much. <laughs> like back in the day, like uh, uh, microtransactions within the new Star Wars Battlefront game were were like the closest thing we've gotten to uh, <laughs> semi dystopic as possible. I don't uh, know. Like Activision Blizzard stuff is pretty horrendous nowadays. Oh yeah, like no, I uh, like I, I yeah I refuse to buy any Activision game, like any Activision Blizzard game. I can uh, Activision Blizzard King game. I'm sorry, that's owned by Microsoft now or soon mm -hmm. soon like it will soon be owned by Microsoft. So Microsoft Activision Blizzard King, uh, yeah, it, everything's fine. Mega corporations are spawning around us. This is fine. Uh, <laughs> Like I did, I, I used to play a lot of Overwatch, and then I I stopped after a while. But like, uh, I still enjoy Overwatch, but like, I won't touch any of the COD franchises because uh, I don't have a hundred and fifty gigabytes to just dedicate. That's also to, a thing. Uh, yeah, it's just like such a one video game <laughs> like, burden for your console, and also like the, that also has like mic like fierce micro interactions on top of it nowadays. Which is why I won't get back in, despite, like, mm -hmm. I liked COD. Like, that was, like, what I played at, for, like, three years straight in university. It was, like, my main thing. I'd play Call of Duty all the time. And I don't play it anymore because, uh, like, the games are just full of microtransactions. And they're not fun as much because, like, you, they taunt you with, like, these things that, like, you can't have unless you pay them money. On top of the 80 bucks you've already spent to buy the game. Mm -hmm. And I mean, arguably, uh, like, they kind of 
pulled the whole 180 on us back in the day. Like, I used to enjoy playing games on PlayStation because PlayStation was free t- to play uh, online, access stuff with. And then uh, they went to pay to play. And uh, uh, Microsoft and PlayStation just kind of s- uh, swapped. So Microsoft went to um, free to play and PlayStation went no, to. No, Mi- Microsoft, pay to play, you so. still pay, I think. You can get a pretty good deal on like Game Pass nowadays, which is like you get free games with it. But um, no, you still pay for Xbox Live, I think. Do you? Yeah, I'm pretty huh. sure. Um, you just don't see the cards anymore uh, on around anymore. Yeah, it's been a while since I've actually sat down and played on a console. So uh, once again, PC Master Race. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like a lot of people are like, I- I'm probably not gonna buy another one, like another console. I don't know. It's it- it'd be one thing if you could get the next generation of consoles, which you just can't right now. Uh, yeah. Anyway. But yeah, no, that's like the um the blurb on like the front of my copy of Ready Player One, which I have right here, is like enchanting Willy Wonka meets the Matrix USA today. Yeah, I wish that were true, but um yeah, no, it's just sucks. It's just a shitty video game that they've presented to me, and it's like this isn't doesn't sound fun at all. I don't really want to play this. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's not. Yeah. Books written by Ernest Klein. He's uh, this was his first novel. Um, and people were really impressed with it. Like he sold the movie rights before it even was published. So this has been coming out for a while. Um, it took them like five years to make the movie to get this uh, like start making the movie. But um, whatever. That's how it is. You can't like the guy. You made his money. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's written in uh like first person perspective. One of the issues is like the like something they left out of the movie, which is like maybe my favorite part of the book, is like they have these scenes after like they find a key, um, and then they have to when you find a key to the one of the essentially to find the Easter egg, you need to find three keys. And in the book, you have to plug them into three, uh, each have to plug them into a gate, and then you fin- figure out another challenge, and that gives you a hint toward the next key. Um, in the movie, they simplify this to, uh, you just find the keys, and there's one big gate at the end, which is fine. They gotta compress it for the movie, whatever. Every time they find, like, a, uh, a gate or a key location, it becomes this big war, because the bad guys in the book, um innovations online interactive or something ioi is what they call them they have this uh like group of people called the sixers which is um like a big corporate entity that's trying to win this contest that uh how they set up so that this um ioi which is the second biggest company in the world can take over the biggest company in the world because the um the big key to the city is just sitting right there and uh monopoly laws anti-monopoly laws are a joke so yeah that's not going to be done done with anything like they've been a joke for a long time (laughs) even back in the day we're like i think um even like the big anti-monopoly thing that the u.s government actually did with um like uh standard oil whatever uh rockefeller's company was um when they broke that up it just became like okay now the biggest company in the world is six massively giant corporations which are like huge and they've actually let those corporations start merging back together like two of them like re-merged um like exxon mobile is uh like two parts of that breakup from all the time ago so those laws that like those anti monopoly policy in the states is a joke for a number of reasons so yeah and essentially every time they find one of these objectives um ioi sends in the sixer sixers to like make a giant perimeter around the gate or the key location or whatever and um all the like um guys looking for the egg just like go to war with the sixers like all out 
go to war with like massive like the most powerful items in the game just become like a big server war and it's the most interesting part of the book which is all told from like wade not participating in any of it and just saying what happened and they could have shown some of that because it's by far the most interesting part of the book of these and like we do see um at the end they do one of these but yeah but in the book we get like four of them that aren't described in much detail and i would have liked to see more of those in the movie which uh i mean i don't know what the budget the budget probably would have been blown as it is so um yeah there's budget issues there but as i said the book isn't very good <laughs> so I mean, the problem yeah one of the bigger problems that they they've uh <laughs> uh much to uh <laughs> there was a video game i i, I want to say it was uh uh probably the first destiny game mm -hmm. where they um lacked character like within the game characters were uh solid based objects and so there was no like characters phasing in between other characters and so <laughs> To go do something, you had to stand in an actual physical line in a video game to try and get to, like, a quest. Mm. Or, oh, like, to a vendor or something. And, <laughs> and that's, um, like, the sort of shit that just happens so, in this game. And we see honest. that. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, we see that in here where people are lining up to get to teleporters when, like, if this was an actual video game, there would be no no need for a line and i think uh i think that's one of the things that world of warcraft did very well was uh at least they were phasing in between uh characters and so i mean that game had its own problems and oh, yeah, bugs sure. but that's yeah. completely hilarious but yeah this game but yeah those are those are my favorite parts of the book and they're just like sort of left out of the movie entirely because I think to Ernest Klein, they're just like secondary things. But I think um, I honestly would have loved to like have like a second point of view character who um, we show those battles going on from their perspective because they sound fucking wild and it would be fun. But yeah, I think one of the main things is like the movie, the book, like both of them, I suppose. They need to like admit that the game's dumb or like that the quest is dumb like this is some rich assholes peasant project in which he like throws millions of people's lives and like billions of people's lives into like chaos because he want because he wanted to like pretend to be king arthur for a little bit um, and like give away the throne or whatever, or the like the lady at the lake or whatever. And they also just worship like the ground Taladay walks on, despite the fact he's like not a good guy. Like the game he created sucks. I can't stress this enough. The game I, I th sucks. I think and like everyone worships his feet, and all that they're fighting for is to make is to keep the game from becoming slightly worse, which would be an interesting point to make, except the point the book doesn't make it because they need to worship fucking Holiday because he's such a libertarian king who, like, made all his money from, like, he pulled himself up by his bootstraps and made himself the richest guy in the world. It, like, there's just, like, a capitalist wet dream of a character that they've made I, th up. I think that... I think the in the, in the book it's uh a little bit different because but it's also still I guess the same thing but like basically like Halliday didn't really do anything spectacular in the like he's like well what would happen if we just like take everything everybody loves and put it into like a centralized hub and then like profit off of like this giant open market essentially because th that's all he did was just like take like a lot of like <laughs> other stuff that he likes and then just dumped it like well he did invent the hardware mm -hmm. like that is brought up which is like billionaires don't invent things 
that's just the thing. They pay people to do that for them, and then they break the profits. That's the, the way things, yeah. It's, yeah, and this book just has a problem with, like, not dealing with, like, real problems. Like, they, they keep saying that, like, um, one of the morals that, like, they try to throw in is, like, oh, uh, Wade spends too much time in the Oasis and he needs to, like, step, a step away from it. But stepping away from it would assume, like, dealing with real life stuff. It's not physically going outside. Like that, that's, that seems like a strange thing, mm -hmm. but I don't think the main issue here, the main issue like with this universe isn't that like Wade plays too many video games. It's that the fucking world's falling apart and we're all like fighting like a huge digital war so that like our favorite video game doesn't become slightly more terrible. That's all it is. It's like we're fighting for nothing and they want us to be excited about it. Yes, but in their defense, have you ever watched a YouTube ad? Yeah, where are you going with this? Okay, okay. So what I'm saying is how fast into a YouTube ad do you click fucking the skip ad button? Usually immediately because they the ads are... Exactly. Yeah. I still don't see your point, Cody. My point is, is we all fucking hate ads. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants ads into anything that they can. As soon as we like see an ad, we just instantly skip it. Now, imagine if you were fucking having ads like imprinted into your brain by companies that wanted to sell it. OK, so here's here's my counterpoint to that. The issue is uh it, this is this is less like that and more like um, if a new company wanted to come in and buy Google and make Gads totally unskippable and like may may also make YouTube like a paid subscription service like that. Like that's the sure. stakes here to me. Like that's how I see it. Like it just the issues with this world are like big and they like, oh, yeah, don't. um um holiday is so good despite like it's bootlicking of billionaires and i don't like it because they like demonstrate so hard that like this game sucks and if ernest klein was even a little bit aware of that we'd maybe have a decent novel on our hands but no we're just supposed to pretend this is a fun thing all this could be in theory solved by playing a better video game which they can't do probably because um, Oasis has made like himself like this big central thing. And like all things come through Oasis. The only way they got all these IPs to like all let all these references into this movie is, is like Oasis has reached like monopoly levels. Like they have like taken over all intellectual property that exists. And I'm just not supposed to like take some great like concern about that at all um <laughs> like one of the things like that i think that i think it's stated in the book a lot better but i think one of the it's it, it goes back to like what we were saying earlier about the metaverse i feel like there was uh an open space concept within the oasis for people to design whatever they also wanted yeah so i mean Theoretically, there would be new releases within the within the novels. I don't know how much how much that uh, bleeds over into the the movie, though. So yeah, and in the novel, like you can't go to these like fancy extra worlds anyway. So with unless you have money, so it only matters so much um, whether or not they're making new content. Yeah, if if they put like any any form of like socialist program into the oasis to like at least for like your first 10 levels or whatever like because like at this point in time the oasis is somehow integrated into the education system i do believe like in the in the books wayne's in school or wade's in school compared to like uh 
that's actually a central thing is like um he has like a free oasis um account so like he can um play like he he has like free access to like his school planet and that's it like he cannot go anywhere else because he does not have any real like money to like buy more uh to buy him buy his way off planet unless he like mooches it off of uh his friend h who's uh he just doesn't do that and like it's also like asking physically like for bus fare, literal bus fare every time this is and like again this is like mm-hmm. Already, before IOI will do anything, one of the worst free-to-play experiences I can imagine. It just sucks so hard, like, on its surface. And they want me to, like, get, like, immersed in this. I'm like, oh, this is so cool, man. It, um, join the Oasis, and uh, you have to, you have to um, get your allowance every week so you can um, play some quests and then lose everything when some... Uh, like um neckbeard kills you and like steals all your stuff because this is a hardcore v- pvp mmo and uh we just lose all yeah, our stuff there was was also there was that's not 100 percent the case though in the books there was the pvp zones and then there was pve zones not everything was complete you still PvP lose your days. stuff if you die to enemies though like like yes but like no okay it's the, so I don't know if you ever played uh, World of Warcraft. Not really, no. Okay, then, well, there's a place in the World of Warcraft uh, called... I can't remember the name of the actual content, but or continent, but there was a place in World of Warcraft called uh, Gruul's Arena, and their arena, uh, like the content around it was... Uh, continent around it was basically completely pvp placed. I would run in with a 30-level character... And I would literally purposefully keep my level 100 character off the side so I can actually sit there and play in that zone. Because if I didn't, some level 100 rogue would just come one-shot me for no reason. It's not worth it. (laughs) Now, if I had to restart a character every time I got ganked by a level 100, I'd be pissed. Yeah. But you're also, like, restarting your character every time you die to, like, a regular monster, too, in this. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no, like, like, you can't do any of the combat stuff unless you're, like, losing, like, risking all your stuff. Which is just, like, a terrible model. Um, Some people like it. Um, I wouldn't, like, bet my house on it. That would make it a lot less fun. And, like, the language (laughs) they say where, like, all these people are, like, sort of addicted to the Oasis, that's not good. Like these, this is not a good thing because that's brought up. But also, while we're talking about this, wasn't I don't remember what I was a hundred percent reading there, but uh, apparently the rushing currency at one point was uh, worth worth less than uh, V bucks in Fortnite. <laughs> so what I'm saying is like. If if all of a sudden Russia's like currency completely and entirely dropped down to zero, well, I mean that, that's even like it's just just disgustingly uh, <laughs> like disgusting how far off we are from like a straight up dystopia where like people are like, oh, you should just get into Bitcoin at this point in time. Yeah, and like again, that's another point of this book. It's like. This might be what my tw- what my life is like when I'm in my 40s. Like I don't know that that's not true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I might be living through this sort of shit. I don't. It's not escapism for me at all. It's just like, oh yeah, no. <laughs> um, EA runs at all, like will not like made all the video games terrible and no one can do everything. And also global warming warming is gonna kill us all and we're all living in like these precarious little shitty cheap uh mobile home housing developments because uh we're not allowed to like build anything else because we've made no social progress in the next 20 years like even if the game was fun like the outside world is also horrifying and uh that makes it less fun i think it also at, at one point in time there was a uh, the the comparison between the characters where they're like 
the physics are different, but you're still somehow limited to like what you can actually do as a character, correct? Um, there's some, I think like, like, yeah, the accessibility options are not clear, but, um, it is pointed out that like, um, physical fit, like you'd like, you're not lit. It's not one-to-one like from like your real life. Um, Mm -hmm. like you can enhance your strength and speed. So like, even if you're like a terrible runner, you, you'll like run faster in game maybe it, like this is all, all isn't all like terribly well explained it's all i'm saying is that it really sucked that when like finally this giant world of escapism gets to like um actual fruition and i'm in my 40s trying to outrun like some 22 year old like that's not really fair um yeah and also just like no accessibility like what where are the accessibility options for like uh like disabled like physically disabled people like i feel like you physically can't Mm -hmm. just can't and there's also just like points in this book that are just like neoliberal jerking off of like um or like i should like libertarian stuff where like um there's a point in like the book where they talk about um h who's a um african-american person in real life but they go through this whole speed in the book where like the oasis was the best thing to happen to african-american people because they could uh, pretend they weren't african-american and like be afforded more opportunities which is um which if if you're only thinking in terms of money might sound like a positive thing and get more power to the people that like profit off that i guess but um it leaves this kind of like, oh, cool. We didn't really solve racism or anything. We just like hit it so that like no one can see it. That's fun. That's fine. Yeah, no, there's just like stuff like that which I don't like, and that's on and that's more on Ernest Klein than it is on um than it is the fault of like the book or like or like the fictional universe. And Ernest Klein isn't like the worst guy in the world, from what I can tell. He's like not like he has some like bad takes but um they're not like the worst takes you know like it's like stuff that like oh yeah um like in the sequel like he um like says something that's like oh yeah non-binary people are cool but they go they go about it in this way like Oh yeah, I realized this because I I went through a bunch of sex simulations with non-binary people and like realized like oh yeah, that was okay. And uh okay, it's good that you think that's okay, but it was a weird way it, you you went about that a weird way, bud. The sequel's not very good either. It's just like if it like it continues with like riddles is part of the problem. Like it just does the same thing over and over again with uh different stakes, you know? Uh, we won't get into it too yeah. much because um, it's not terribly relevant. It just doesn't address anything that like if you didn't like the first one, you're definitely not going to like the second one because it doesn't bring anything new to the table, which I think is a good tactic for sequels to do is just like to address like uh, issues you had with the first book or whatever. Um, yeah, there's supposed to be like a sequel to this movie coming out eventually, um, but who knows? It made money, but not like oodles. It made some money. And there is also a third book on the way, apparently, uh, that they're calling Ready Player Zero. Which, yeah. Also, like, the end of the second one also does this whole thing that, like, uh, a lot of billionaires like to say. We're like, we need to move into space to avoid the consequences of global warming. Which, uh, fuck that that's just awful i'm not gonna go into it here but like fuck that take (laughs) anyway okay into the movie i guess because we talked about this much so yeah uh the movie opens to my least favorite thing opening narration describing the things they're showing me on screen the best thing in the world um in any uh speculative fiction where they just do a opening monologue where they explain everything that's happening on screen. Which is terrible because the screen is doing a lot of work here. They show 
like the stacks and everything and they show like him wandering around and like it, it says i think it says more, like the opening like um pan across of this of this location show tells us a lot more about the world than like a lot of sci-fi stories do like what does a like what does a bunch of neon lights and blade runner mean like you could talk about that but like here you know exactly what it is because it's like oh there's these are like a bunch of mobile homes stacked in a bunch of very precarious scaffolding this isn't safe and that's meant to like imply something about the world like this is kind of like a shitty place and uh that wade has kind of a shitty life and yeah it's a whole thing um we see wade climbing down his uh stack with like ropes and stairs and making his way to the bottom the the ground where he sneaks into a uh hideout he has where he um can log into the oasis um video game um we also get our uh, obligatory uh holiday worship for this intro talk about how he's so cool and he invented the modern world and blah 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 blah, blah. yeah um yeah just let just let your cinematography speak for itself guys you don't need to show off like you don't need to physically tell us everything that happens in the movie um i know your producer says that um you have to do it because people won't get it um ignore him because he's wrong like he is in it yeah it, he is definitely wrong about that because it always makes the movie worse all the time and yeah no and yeah i hate it and we see uh wade watts our main character log into the oasis where he is playing the character parcival who's um uh, named after who's like named after the uh arthurian knight parcival 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 yeah i think um depending on what version you're reading it's spelled a little bit differently he's going with like the parcival spelling who was uh, the arthurian knight that found the holy grail grail essentially is like a cool thing because uh they're looking for the easter egg so they can take over the oasis the quest has been going on for five years and there is one guy i've guessed found the first clue and opened up this portal to like this big race that you uh can go into and perhaps and potentially win the copper key uh which is the first key um this is notably different from the book where they uh, did a whole thing where like uh, Wade found a place on his school planet that he, uh, or his school server planet thing he lived on and uh, found like the Tomb of Horrors from original D&D and like made his way through it until uh, he managed to beat a classic D&D villain at a game of Joust, which is an Atari, which is an arcade game. So yeah, that was a thing, and they changed it very much in this into a uh, big fancy car race where they can show off special effects, which is it's a cool it's a cool race. It's just um like debatably no, it's definitely not as in, it's not as interesting, fun to watch, but it also like breaks the principle that was like kind of established in the books of like um like I'll give this to the book it very much um. The things that happen in the book are very much in line with like what you'd expect in real life. Um, if that makes sense. Cause um like if one guy finds something in a video game, everyone else will know that know what happened soon after. And like there's a very brief moment of discovery, but um, and then everyone just copies them, which is what happens in the book every time, which is just very realistic but they don't do that in the book because like how they solve this puzzle is that um wade decides he should uh like drive backwards because he finds like a uh video clip where yeah essentially um wade they find uh they have this thing these they find this thing called there's this place called the journal uh, holiday's journal which is like this big location in the movie um in the book it's just like they don't this isn't the thing he they just all the um gunters is what they call them egg hunters they like just have extensive notes and are just like experts on uh 
who Halliday is, but in the movie they just have uh, random video clips or plays that like reenact scenes from uh, Holiday's life. And uh, uh, Wade figured finds some line where um, Wade, where Holiday is just like, "Hey, why can't we just go backwards? Just go backwards, slam the pedal as hard as you can." Uh, and Wade's just like, "Oh, that's a hint," and then drives backward in the race course, like, and finds the copper key, which is doesn't make sense because it's not a particularly weird puzzle. Like in this sort of thing. Um, if you're not like, you got to think like the, some of these guys are like speed runners and shit. And like, the first thing they do is fucking like try driving into random walls to see if it worked, which is what Wade does. Um, so that'd be like the first thing that would happen as soon as they found this place. Um, which is, does a disservice because the world just works entirely different right now. It feels like, and this is kind of, it feels like they're trying to, like, okay, the book's definitely trying to pander to uh, our, uh, like, our generation. Yeah. Like, if not a little older, but yeah. Where, yeah, well, if not a little older, but also, like, it's a young adult fiction novel, so they're also trying not, to pander yeah. to, uh, like, the generation after us nowadays. Um, uh, and so, like, the book does a really good job of, like, oh, this makes me feel nostalgic over something that I had in my childhood, um, but definitely not something that I had in my childhood because I've never sat down and played uh, a game of Joust in my life. Like, I've played Mario and something, like, more recent, Sonic the Hedgehog, stuff like that. Not quite this old. Um, and then this is, like, pandering to the newer generation where they're like, we need to put fast cars and Kong and a T-Rex and explosions or a racetrack or, yeah. like, uh, something visual on the screen. Like, so, like, as I was saying earlier, like, if we, if we wanted to still take that whole 1980s aesthetic and still try and jam like a decent reference into this scene what they could have done is had him drive backwards into like a tron track hmm. where he's playing tron up against like an ai because they he played an ai in the book i don't know why that's so yeah like, hard but he just continues to try like he just bypasses this whole entire race doesn't have to do anything hard and then just oh yeah no that's another gets thing. the first key for basically nothing yeah that's true um like yeah no it's it no like in in the book the challenges are quite hard like it's like it requires mm -hmm. a lot of brain work but they they require a lot of technical skill too like becoming like you have to be like an like when i said he uh won a game of joust earlier like he won like like a high level game of joust which he only knows because like h is like a really good joust player but yeah yeah no it, it, it's like a whole thing and like he also has to go through like the tomb of horrors which is like notoriously broken D, &D dungeon mm -hmm. it's like i think like even if you read like the earliest versions of it like it doesn't entirely make sense like there's like yeah okay like there's just like some things where it just doesn't entirely translate to like from the guy who originally wrote the tomb of horrors and i think I, I think that's a, another thing is like like one of the things that uh, you didn't get with this whole car race is the fact that like in the books percival if he he loses in the tomb of horrors he loses everything right which they lose everything in this. I guess if he crashes and stuff like that, that that he loses everything, but he doesn't. And I mean he doesn't lose everything in the in the Tomb of Horrors. But like also he's only he's allowed one game against the the I wanna say the demi lich or the skeleton king or whatever. It was it a is lich of some sort. Tomb of Horrors. 
It's a lich of some sort. Um, I can maybe find this, but he fights a lich of some sort. Yeah, and he only gets to do it once every day. Yeah, he only well he doesn't he manages it on his first try, but he can only try once a day. And so like there was there was like really hard stakes here. Uh like after he gets to the end of this race and like the first uh scene when he he goes in the first time, like uh he's about to hit the finish line and this Kong stops him in the middle of the road, him and Artemis. He ends up like pulling her off his or off her bike to like so that she avoids hitting this giant Kong, but like even at that, like Yeah, just... that's the that's the one example where like he saves her from like uh losing all her stuff, which is like meant to be the thing. Because if your a- avatar dies, you lose everything. Which is Well, true. I'm just saying, like uh, this is this Kong has like fucking zero aggro radius where he's like, Well, I'm just gonna step on these people that are like two feet in front of me. He doesn't like jump up or do anything after they're right there in front of him and out of a vehicle. Yeah, the name of the uh, Lich in Tomb of Horrors is the Demi Lich Aserak. Yeah, it's um, on. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's Aserak in the book. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, it's chapter nine. But yeah, yeah, there were two races, and in the second race, he figures out the key, which puts Parsival at the top of the. Uh, <laughs> big leaderboard of the game where uh by giving him a hundred thousand points so he becomes a celebrity because uh yeah he's the first guy to score points in this game which in this big easter egg hunt for Mm -hmm. the fate of this entire giant uh metaverse thing so yeah before he had done this uh before he gets the egg between the uh, first race he goes in, where they demonstrate how terrifying the race is, and the second race where he wins, uh, Wade in, uh, invites Artemis over to H's place, where H will uh, recover. Will uh, H is uh, uh, Parsival's best friend, who's a big uh, modder in this. Um, wasn't the thing in the book, I don't think, but. Uh, uh, not that's neither here nor there. So they have a chat while uh, H is fixing Arcival's uh, bike, which is the bike from Akira. And yeah, the, he ends up kind of embarrassing himself in front of Artemis, which is sort of what happens in the book. I think the art, uh, their relationship, it's different in the movie because uh, Parsival will fall in love with Ars- Artemis, but uh, Wade is much more like endearing to Artemis in this, in the movie than he is to the book. Um, in the book, they just kind of flirt for a little bit before Artemis dumps him and they get back together right at the end, which is interesting. So yeah, they end up, they, they do the thing where they meet and we're introduced to Artemis. Uh, and then we go back and, uh, we, uh, Wade goes, get the hint. And then he does the second race where he goes backwards and wins the key. Um, and we see uh, Anorak, uh, who is Holiday's avatar within the Oasis, uh, give Wade a key, um, which is uh, less of something that happens in the book. I think it does happen a bit, but um, I, this is more in this book movie. They uh, do a lot more to set up like that um, Anorak is more than just like a uh npc avatar in like to like uh tease the uh ready player 2 in which uh holiday sort of comes back through uh through anorak yeah it's it's not important it's just a thing they're doing because it's a yeah whole dumb thing uh we're introduced to the bad guy of the movie uh nolan sorrento who um it's pointed out a little bit later he was an intern at um, Gregorius Games, which is uh, Holiday's company, which is how he got the job as uh, the guy in charge of the Sixers. Sorrento is um, like a face of this multinational, comp- this giant internet multinational IOI, 
and like he's not even like the main person on charge of it but uh it's a whole thing but yeah essentially the sixers uh which is are his operation are like slaves essentially like they do this thing where if you fall into debt in the oasis you can uh be arrested and put into debtor's prison with the company who you are in debt indebted with which would be ioi in this situation so yeah so you end up getting a number um out of like a six digit number to ass assign to you and essentially it's a whole thing where like they have like anonymous accounts and if you're somehow useful to the uh like sixer movement you can uh you can get switched out between uh different accounts so like if you die in one account you can just switch into another account there's a whole thing in the book where like um sorrento has like a modded rig where um some other guy can just like play through his account and like say you want to do like a you need to do like a first person shooter thing you can find a guy who's really good at first person shooters and make them do first person shooters um which is a famously a thing that slaves are good at is that um okay so okay okay, okay. i called them slaves but they're actually indentured servitude and indentured servants which is um only moderate which is moderately different it is still horrendously illegal though so at some point in the uh, next 20 years, they re uh, make they make it so that indentured servitude is legal again, which is fun because it became illegal because uh, you could just trap someone in infinite debt and essentially have a slave. Um, also, like. People just wouldn't pay it, pay the money because uh, you'd like people they do it for like high risk operations and like someone would like die of illness before uh they paid their debt and they wouldn't get whatever they were promised as part of their indentured servitude contract um which became a big problem in the uh early united states um which is why we don't do it anymore um also debtor's prison is also just like another moral con concept and it's just like because it gives um like additional motivation for like a bank to like make you default on your debt so that's fun so yeah they have a whole sixer army um that uh you they can use to hunt for the eggs they haven't had much success and they act very differently from the book like in the book the sixers are like a genuine threat in this they all go down like stormtroopers like not the fun kind of stormtroopers like the bad guys so yeah that's a whole thing he also has like a bounty hunter guy played by tj miller him having like his own bounty hunter guy kind of undermines the whole point of the story because like um part of becoming a sixer is you sign away your rights to uh win the contest so like if a guy's into uh, like not there's no reason for them to let this guy have uh like a unique thing but it's just a thing to make like the movie more cool so they can pretend to have like this whole because this movie the plot of this movie in the book they're trying to replicate a fantasy storyline in a sci-fi setting which doesn't work like the idea appears to be from holiday's perspective is to uh make people learn the lessons that he learned so that you can become worthy of inheriting his throne because he wants to be King Arthur. The problem with that is that you're trying to become an expert in him, and you don't need to like someone to become an expert in them. Like, you're just um, becoming an expert. You're not proving yourself worthy of the Holy Grail. You're proving that you know a lot about how James Holiday thinks. Or even just, there's billions of people in this game, they can just uh, brute force their way through it another thing so yeah yeah i don't also tj miller i don't really care for him so that's not fun what they introduced him it, it was kind of funny but like besides that yeah it's kind of he, yeah he's sort of does tj miller shit in this movie he also we're also introduced to a um 
a uh, Chekhov's gun for later in the movie, the Orb of Oziox, um, which uh, works differently in this, which is kind of important. It's essentially like a big force field that nothing can penetrate. Uh, also, yeah. Uh, after Parsifal, or after Wade finds the Copper Key, um, our main five character, our main five heroes also get the keys. With Artemis getting next, and an H getting next after her, and then these other two guys, Shoto and Daito, getting uh, the keys after them, and then it just becomes a big list of Sixers, um, starting with uh, Sorrento zero 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 one. I don't know if I said enough zeros. Whatever. They team up rather easily in this, and like the book, it's like a full on. The book is very individualist in its uh, operating for the most part. And that's like one of the lessons I think they're trying to learn throughout this is that you need to, is that working together is important um, because they do not interact too much throughout the, the uh, book. And like every time one of these guys meets, it's like a pretty big deal. They do like a chat room at one point um, after some stuff happens in the book and it's like a whole thing and they don't and they go their separate ways as soon after that because it, you can't split the money so they need to work on their own to get the stuff and the last thing you want is for someone else to get the uh purchase or get the easter egg but yeah shoto and daito are the other two guys they're the side characters uh they changed them from the mo novel for better and worse the criticism of them in the novel is that uh, they're uh, Japanese stereotypes. Like they over, like they just full on are stereotypes of like samurai characters in the book, mm -hmm. which uh, draws draws some criticism. It's there. It's lessened in the movie, but only because they're not um, not as much uh, attention is paid to their actions. Um, I think, like they still like bow before people and stuff like it's a whole thing also they change another thing uh with them that i don't really care for but we'll get into that their their role is also just like lessened they're very much just like side characters in this which is for the worse because they have their moments those two i mean they kind of felt like they kind of felt like side characters in the book like true to in itself and then they like they tried to kill. They killed off a. Uh, uh, Shoto, a uh, Dido, I think. One of them, I can't remember. Yeah. But that was like I that think was a good. Shoto. I think they kill off Shoto. Yeah, that was a cool scene though. Like when they do that in the book, it's like a whole thing where like um, there's two instances in which uh, like IOI goes into the real world and just like kills people because they're a threat to them in the game. <laughs> And essentially, uh, it's toward like two thirds of the way through the book. Shoto ends up fighting a uh, Shoto and Dido end up fighting a bunch of Sixers, and because um, Shoto is winning a fight with like them, they end up breaking into Shoto's apartment and fucking tossing him out of a uh, out of out a window, like just murdering this uh, young man in cold blood. Um, and like it gets ruled as a suicide, so it's and, like fuck. when the yeah. stacks blows up, it's it gets blamed on a fucking meth lab. Yeah, that's also br brutal too. We'll get to that though. But I, I like Shoto and Daito are definitely like significant enough parts of the plot in the book, but uh, their parts, their like significance is cut in the movie. Um, they also changed Shoto into a eleven year old, which is meh. I don't know that that fights the stereotypism here because he's at this point, I don't know, like nope. gifted station, gifted Asian kid is also a thing. So I think they didn't, I don't know if it's as bad, but they're not like clearing themselves. The thing to do would have been like to have them do everything, like be like, just like play down the uh, thing or like uh, make it, I don't know. Um, you could probably make it so it's fine. It's just, like, uncomfortable in the book a little bit. Anyway, so Wade goes to the, uh, 
like holidays journal building uh, and gets crowded by a bunch of guys. Um, and this person in a Goro costume from Mortal Kombat, that's him, that's who it is, Goro, drags Wade yeah. away into like a secret uh, room and like just says, you're famous, you can't like uh, go walking around. And uh, he and Wade's just like, wait, who are you? What's going on? And then uh, a chest burster bursts out of Goro's um, chest. And it's a whole thing. And it turns out this is all a big goof by Artemis, which is a good goof. I thought that was pretty, like, it's pretty spooky just seeing a chest burster pop out of Goro's chest. <laughs> That'd be a whole thing. That reminds me, I should, I should probably, at one point in time, in the, like, my whole uh toward career of uh critiquing films i should probably sit down and watch like at least the first alien movie oh you haven't oh they're good i have never on... seen an alien movie. like i've seen like alien versus predator and stuff like that but i don't think i've ever like oh. watched the original trilogy. but yeah no the first two are good if you have i might uh -huh. have them if you want um i can yeah. lend them to you if they're not on like Netflix, they might be. Oh, they're uh, probably on Disney probably Plus. Actually, just find them. I, I think they're on Disney Plus because oh, they might be because they're owned by Fox, because yeah. which Disney owns now. So yeah, they, I think they're on Disney Plus. I'm pretty sure. I'm certain of that actually. Yeah, you can look at them off on Disney Plus. Actually, that's the thing to do. Oh, they are. Yeah, yeah, those are good movies. You should check them out. Um, just the first two though. The rest of them aren't. Um, <laughs> like it's kind of like a. Uh, it's one of those series that I'll actually like sit down and watch. But like, if I were to sit down and watch like, uh, like Freddy versus Jason, I don't think are um, the Halloween movies. I don't think I'll ever sit down and watch Nightmare on Elm Street. Maybe. Uh, well, I got some bad news for you because those are on season four watch list. Uh, not Halloween, but uh, Freddy versus Jason. Uh, yeah, but I'm I'm more I'm more so like it was your idea actually. Yeah. How did I remember that? Stay tuned. Which one? Freddy vs. Jason. You were the one that suggested that. Yeah, Freddy vs. Jason. Like, I, I I don't have a problem when they do, like, the crossover stuff. My problem is, is like, uh, kind of the anticlimactic, like, messages that were sent out in, like, early, uh, I guess it wasn't, uh, it was Friday the 13th. Oh, yeah. I mean, they... Wait, what? <laughs> both those movies, both those first movies, both end up with like kind of a cliffhanger. But uh, anyway, we'll talk about this later. So yeah, the, uh, Artemis and uh, and uh, Wade don some disguises and uh, wander about the uh, the journal and uh, go check out some things. And they talk about what the next hint is going to be, which is just straight up not something they do in the com in the book at all. Like, that is straight up, like, a big no-no in the book. Because, like, that is just the no. They don't let you do that. Because, like, they, they they make a big deal out of, like, not letting someone get ahead of them. But, yeah, um, essentially, uh, Wade points out that there's only one met reference to uh, um, Ogden Morrow's wife, Lyra? Whatever her name is. Um, Kira. Kira. I had it. I was close. It was one letter away. Said, uh, Kira, and then her actual name's Karen. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kira had gone on a date with uh, Holiday, and uh, later on, uh, after they never had a second date, Ogden ended up marrying her, which is a bigger deal in Ready Player Two. It's a whole thing, and like he brings up that like, uh, oh yeah, so. The next, the next uh, riddle said something about like uh, uh, things you uh, like re regretted not doing. Um, so it must be uh, him regretting not uh, like going on a second day with Kira. And he also points out that this is the only uh, mention of Kira in the journals, which is a thing that's not in the book because. Uh, they, that's not how the journal works in a book and that's not like a big place in a book whatever and he even makes a bet on it and uh the butler guy who runs the journal uh flips a coin over to wade which uh, uh artemis ends up catching because he doesn't really want it uh because it's a quarter 
which uh, causes a plot hole later because he needs that coin for later in the movie. But uh, we don't see Artemis hand it back to him. I don't believe. No, he does. She does. She oh, she does. It back to him. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that was yep. a thing. But no, in the uh, game, in the book, it's just like a like it doesn't leave your inventory at all. So it's a whole weird thing. He also gets it in a different way, and that's not here the... over there. No, it is definitely fucking here or there because the problem is, is he literally makes a bet with this guy and Buddy just hands him a coin. In the in the books, it's completely like illegal for Ogden Morrow to uh, help in the con uh, the contest in any way, even though he kind of does. But um, well, no, he helps him in real life. He doesn't give him any clues to what. The, okay, that's the, the distinction. The I guess or anything mostly because he doesn't mostly because he doesn't know but my point here being is like in the books he wins this extra life by playing like a perfect game of pac-man yeah that's a thing. how many people do you know who can sit down and play play a perfect game of pac-man or maybe it wasn't pac-man no it was pac-man maybe it was pac-man it was pac -Man. I, i'm not too okay either way like still like no yeah he gets it through like uh going on like this sort of dead end looking for a clue which is maybe just another an easter egg on top of an easter egg but yeah it's a coin so artemis and wade are going to go on a date to a uh to a dance club that was one of uh holiday's original creations this also entire scene also feels very mansplainy uh because like artemis is in the book just as smart as Wade is towards all this stuff. She had actually also found the Tomb of Horrors in the book, but just hadn't managed to beat the uh, the game of uh, Joust because she wasn't she needed practice at it, and that's why she didn't get the key first. Which uh, makes it feel very weird when in the movie, like Wade just explains what happens, uh, what the next thing is to her, and she's just like, "Oh wow, I didn't know about this," which is yeah, it's. It doesn't jive with the mood of the book, which was, uh, I, th I thought was like a neat aspect of how the narrative of the book worked, which is a shame, which it's that it's left out of the movie. H gives Wade shit about this because, um, H points out like, Hey, you don't know that Artemis is even a real girl. And you're like going out on like a date with, uh, a date with her in the book they make it like a crack about this being they make a little bit of a transphobic crack while like uh artemis and wade are in like a chat room and talking about this having a, a similar conversation but yeah this is also like this thing where um h uh doesn't uh like that way like it, it, it reads in the book and in this like h doesn't like uh wade hanging out with uh uh artemis for like some other more romantic reason which is kind of something you can read into it but i guess it's it's not a thing like they straight up just say oh yeah h isn't uh interested in men in the in the book i don't know that it's like stated in the movie that h uh oh yeah it, okay this, this doesn't make sense because i've said h uh as a guy right now h turns out to be a lady uh, yeah, she's a African American lady who is a lesbian uh, in the book, but I don't know that that's um, stated in the movie. It is maybe hinted at when like H goes to like uh, kiss a uh, kiss a lady in like Avatar form. But yeah, I suppose that's the notice for it in the movie. But yeah, moving on. But yeah, they go. To, uh, it, Artemis and Wade go to the dance club. Uh, Wade tells uh artemis his real name which she gets like freaked out about and like oh you shouldn't do that you don't even know me why are you trusting me uh also the bounty hunter that uh sorrento had hired overhears this um along with a bunch of other information uh he had heard about like uh wade getting like a special like uh suit that he bought with uh some prize money he got when he got the copper key uh, which will allow the bounty hunter to uh, trace um, the Wades that bought a X1 bodysuit. And uh, they that's how they ended up finding uh, Wade in this. In the book, they do like a whole thing with like school records and whatnot. 
But yeah, anyway, mm-hmm. um, it's different, but it's yeah, not an important difference because the way the bounty hunter is a character exclusive to the movie. So yeah, at, uh, at later on this, Wade says he's in love with Artemis, which uh, yeah, I don't know. You can say this uh, say this about like any uh, like a lot of movie and book romances where like the lo- relationship is sort of forced. Uh, it's maybe more forced in the movie. Uh, but you can make an argument for the book being more forced too. Like I think you could argue it either way if you like really wanted to. Um, I don't really want yeah. to, so we're gonna move on. <laughs> so yeah, uh, during their date, the Sixers attack because they're trying to like kill Wade and yeah Wade and Artemis, uh, so they can take them off the scoreboard, uh, which wouldn't necessarily do anything because they could just get the copper key again and be right back in the race, which is like a dumb thing that like, even the bounty hunter points out is dumb. Um, and it's not really why they um, pull off attacks on these guys in the book either. It's just like, they're like, that's why they go to kill them in like real life in the books is because killing their avatars doesn't do anything. They just have to restart. Um, which is a whole thing like the points like are interesting but they don't actually matter you know because like it like it's a deep little narrative device but it's not actually important to the plot which is fine but it's just not actually important to the plot um which makes this into a little bit of a plot hole but uh anyway they also uh artemis points out like some of her backstory is that the reason she wants to win this is to keep IOI from winning it because uh, IOI sort of killed her father uh, by uh, like bringing him into one of these, what they call them, the loyalty centers, which are the indentured servitude camps uh, buildings, I should say. It's not a camp, technically. It's a actual uh, like skyscraper or something. But um, this is wildly different from the book. Uh, this is not mentioned as something that happens in the book. Um, she does not like IOI in that, but uh, the main contention point between her and Wade in the book was like, she was just like, hey, I'm going to use some of Holiday's money to like make the world better. Something Wade just scoffs at, which is another reason not to like Wade. Well, also, in the books wasn't notoriously like Wade's whole plan to do exactly what fucking Elon Musk was doing. Oh yeah, like, no, that's a like, whole I'm thing. I'm just gonna get me, yes, and, like absolutely. all the food and like five of my good friends and like just blast off into space and never have to deal with this planet again. <laughs> totally, totally true. Yeah, that's that. I think I was mentioning that a bit at the beginning, like. This is so much plays into, like, Jeff Bezos thinks this, too, of, like, we need to go into space and get all the polluting stuff out of space, into space, so it doesn't pollute the Earth. And it's like, no, 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 you're making this way more complicated than it needs to be. You just need to give up some of your money. And then they just stare at you, just be like, I don't understand. That doesn't make any sense. Why would I give up any money? For any reason. This is America, and not, like, communist Russia. So I get to keep all the money I could ever want. But anyway, so yeah, it's also, she's just like, oh yeah, Wade, you just live inside the game, which is, yeah, I've already talked about that a bit. So Wade, after um, Sorrento has figured out who he is, uh, Wade gets an invite to talk to Sorrento, which happens in the book too. And Wade decides to take him up on the offer to chat. Wade uh, gets projected into uh, Sorrento's office as a hologram. And he, like, sees all the office, including a password just duct taped to, uh, or, like, sticky noted to the side of uh, Sorrento's immersion rig, which is uh, a thing that does serve him some undoing, Um, which is also really convenient, because in the book, how he gets this password, which he uses later in the movie to get uh, get one over on uh, uh, on IOI, is to, like, he, like, pays like tens of thousands of dollars to get this code on the black market and it's just like one of those things there's a lot of stuff that just happens off screen in the book and this is like a very interesting way of doing it they very much portray sorrento as kind of an idiot in this which i don't 
entirely. I mean, his, his password's bossman69. Also, yes. So. That should also not be forgotten. His password is bossman69. <laughs> um. <laughs> That's kind of on him at this point. Yeah, it no. Also, it also has uh, a lot to say about the fact that, like, biometrics are apparently not in play at all here. Yeah, I think that's true, though. Um, I don't think these integrate with your what brains. Do you mean? Like, I don't think these integrate with your brains at all. I don't think that's... Well, it doesn't have to integrate with your ba brain, though. It just has to scan your fucking face or fingerprints or... Like, it shows that they they were doing facial scans earlier, but uh, all of a sudden, later on in the movies, people are just using this guy's rig. Like, I, I'm saying that there's no rig-to-person ratio where, like, if I sat down at somebody else's rig, it's just going to give me access because I have the password. Like, I mean, arguably, that's how phones work. But, I mean, like, this is supposed to be the future. Yeah, there's some weird things um, about that. But, um, yeah, uh, Sorrento tries to trick, like, off he offers Wade a job, essentially. And uh, Wade's just like, eh, maybe if they fire you, I'll consider it. And he's just like, you know what? I was hoping you say you'd say no. And then uh, they set off bombs in these stacks where Wade's family live, where Wade live, where Wade is living. But because he has this little hideout where he goes into, where he has all his uh, Oasis stuff, he is not in the stacks when they blow up the building. So they just murder like a lot of people. Um, it's actually less brutal in the movie than it is in the book because it's pointed out in the book that these stacks are kind of like right next to each other. So you can like, if, uh, it's like an actually common thing in this universe where these stacks, one will fall over, fall into another one and so on and so on killing like hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. It's like a whole terrifying thing because these are flimsy uh, like things and like I've this is just neoliberal hell that these people live in. But yeah, they essentially they blow up uh, Wade's stack and just like, oh, there turned out to be a meth lab in there somewhere. Uh, that's more clarified in the movie, but uh, or in the book, but uh, they just blame it on a meth lab. Which is something, about, which is another just statement about how shitty this neighborhood is. In the it's book, also, like, it's yeah, really go. weird that Go ahead. The way they try and give this uh, uh, person, like, this morality complex throughout the, uh, in the movie, where, like, they're going back and forth between this middle man or this middle lady where she's like, yeah, we can, we can definitely put a hit out on this teenager, but they're like, just remember that it's on your conscience or something. And then later on in the book, she's like, well, if you want to actually kill this guy, why don't you take that gun and do it yourself? And then, like, later on in the movie, it's supposed to be this big fucking thing when he asks for a gun from one of his security officers. And they, it's like, yeah. no, the character literally had no problem with murdering a hundred people. Why are you trying to make him more sympathetic by the end of the movie? Yeah, famously, uh, mob bosses, uh, like, don't kill anyone themselves ever. That's just famously a thing that is true. Which I am comparing this guy to a mob boss, because, uh, yeah, there's nothing cartel -y about this situation at all. So, yeah, so Wade's family is dead, and briefly after this, he sends a message to, uh, everyone else, and, uh, Wade gets kidnapped and brought to a undisclosed location in Columbus where this movie takes place. Uh, and it turns out that uh, Artemis is part of a rebellion that has kidnapped him. Uh, and now him and Artemis are like together in real life. Uh, her name is Sam. I like, I, I just r really hate this as like a, a, like a trope in itself where like all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah. And here's a rebellion which we will not use and or interact with in any other way except for this one throwaway comic. Like, we're not actually doing anything as an organization to, like, 
like do an uprising of any sort or something like they the, I don't understand the point of the intro like maybe it was like a pop culture reference to something like uh, Star Wars or something but like it really doesn't do anything I think the explanation is is that they felt like they weren't doing enough uh like real world um anti corporate stuff in the book so this is like they're trying to step up their game toward that but i agree there's like a lot of um like these guys call themselves the rebellion yet like a little later in the movie when uh this when ioi raids this place they don't do anything to fight to fight back like yeah they're the rebellion but they don't have any like guns or they don't fight these guys at all which is lame mm -hmm. yeah uh, just did not want to... It's also the US. Everyone has guns. Like, just... What? Oh, yeah. What? The the gun control finally happened in 20... Like, in the corporate dystopia of the 2040s, there somehow managed to end up with gun control happening. That actually happened. That's, like... I'm supposed to believe that little bit of progress occurred sometime between uh, now and the 2040s. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, they're chatting, and at this point, the, uh, High Five, which is what they call them, have, like, fully teamed up, um, and are working together. Another thing about Sam, uh, it, it was pointed out that, like, she doesn't look like her avatar, but, um, by that, it's like, oh, uh, in real life, she has, like, the world's most minor facial deformity. Yeah. Which, like, it wasn't described in depth <laughs> as terms of, in terms of the book. Like, it wasn't, like, I don't think there was, like, a huge description of it. But it just seems like, oh, yeah, this uh, really pretty girl has, like, a tiny red gloss that goes over one side of her eye. Which is, uh, okay, yeah, totally valid that, like, she'd, like, um, over, like, 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 women's beauty standards and all that. There's, like, like she might, uh, quote-unquote, overreact to it. Um, which is a thing that I can totally believe is a character trait, but it's um, one of the complaints about this book is it's really wish fulfilling, and uh, it's just, I don't know, it's it's weird. It's just like, they could you didn't want to spend any more on the makeup at all, or whatever. I don't know. She reminds me of uh, the, uh, Princess Zuko Zuko from Avatar The Lost Airbender. Prince Zuko. Yes. Like, that's a, the level of, like... And I did just check to make sure it's not, like, a thing on her in real life. Because that'd be one thing if this was, like, the actress just had this, um... Whatever the skin condition is in real life. Um, that would be one thing. But it's... No, it's it's makeup. Yeah, it's definitely makeup. Yeah, because uh, Olivia I mean, Cook's the actress. The books too. It also seems like... I don't know, maybe it's... It doesn't seem like it's maybe the hardest thing to use, like, cover-up, but I don't know anything about makeup. Anyway, um, this is also, like, a weird discussion anyway. It's... Anyway, we're gonna move on. It's not the most productive thing in the world. Oh, yeah, another thing about this scene. Uh, Wade... The death of Wade's family had, had um... Like, minimal impact in the novel. It has even less impact in the movie. In the book, actually, they're... Uh, Wade's aunt, who he lives with, is quite abusive, uh, along with, uh, but, and in the movie, like, the aunt's a little better, but still abusive, but yeah, it's, they're, they're, they're not the nicest to him, but I think, also, like, other people lived in that building, like, it's pointed out there was, like, a nice lady who would occasionally feed Wade occasionally, who, uh, dies in that explosion in the book in the movie she lives so that's another just um need to take away some emotional uh build up from this character you know um i just i just feel like there was too much emotion from wade in the book and we need to just dial that back a little bit um uh, you know just can't have too many uh can't have too much uh nuance going later into the movie and like righteous fury at like he's not gonna have to stare down this guy who killed his aunt later in the movie which he does in the movie and not in the book like in the book at least they have the uh, excuse of like oh they don't really meet i guess they meet in, in the game but like in the movie they like stare face to face at each other but yeah anyway yeah. 
but like in, in the book has like way more more character deaths because they actually kill off one of the high five like yeah they kill off Shoto. this movie like takes all the emotional out of like the actual storyline like, and there wasn't a shit ton in the book i got mosquito bites wasn't out there that long but i got mosquitoes. i haven't seen any mosquitoes yet but I, um, I haven't been out in the in the country yet so. yeah no i i was moving some stuff and i cut a bit of grass and another thing one more thing uh perhaps the greatest crime of all this entire movie commits um they americanize uh artemis who is canadian in the novel so this is their biggest crime by far she is from Vancouver in the novel. I mean, Artemis in the in the yeah, but in the books, it's not like they made like a giant deal out of the fact that she's Canadian. Like, no, but it is still um, a grievous crime. I, I guess there's there's such a big difference that you see nowadays. But like, like unless we're like stereotyping Canadians, like we're not that much different from now, the Americans. No, 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 Cody, 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 Cody. Cody. And Here's I mean, the thing about like patriotism. It, it goes the same way. It doesn't make any sense. You're supposed to get needlessly mad oh, yeah. about nonsense, and that's called patriotism, Cody. This is how it works. Um, <laughs> Honestly, they, they they do, like... And, it, and if we don't do it, them, them, uh, them darn immigrants will come take all our... Uh, like um, backyards or something. What the what the devil and uh, what the devil are white people us white people supposed to be scared of nowadays? Um, uh, they'll bring the critical race theory. Yeah, that'll happen. Critical uh, race theory. Yeah, that's a big thing. Apparently in the states, it might be a Canada too. I don't listen to uh, our very conservative news radio if I can help it. But Dad has a slow up radio sometimes. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so that's the worst thing that did in this movie. Um, as uh, meanwhile, as Wade and Sam are making kissy faces at each other, Sam says, "Oh shit, I figured it out," and they go to the library and gather up the other five, uh, the other members of the High Five, uh, which is what they call them, the five main heroes of the book, and they go to find out. They'd gone to the dance club to find the clue the last time. But uh, they didn't figure it out. But uh, they decided to uh, try to uh, find the next key through going through whatever movie Halliday and Kira had gone to on their first day on their date. I said I was about to say first date, but there's only one date, so I mean that's still true. But if if you say first date, it implies like later dates. That seems like a line someone would say, and it's like. Oh, yeah, it was our first date. It's like, we only had one date, you fucking jackass. Leave me alone. Stop calling me. But yeah, they figure out that... Um, oh, I didn't turn my phone on silent. So they figure to go to the movie, and uh, they figure out that the movie they went to, or the movie they're supposed to look in anyway, was uh, The Shining. Because I'm pretty sure Warner Brothers owns that movie, so they can use all the sets they want. Let's see, who makes Shining? Uh, yep, Warner Brothers owns uh, distributed The Shining, which I also haven't seen. I've seen it; it's all right. I just have a theory. I'm going to make. Uh, okay, no, I thought maybe they had the the set remade for Doctor Sleep, but uh, which is the sequel to The Shining. Uh, but no, that movie doesn't come out for another two years. I suppose they could have kept the set set open. I don't know what the. Um... Yeah, if that's an actual hotel they use in The Shining or whatever. Not important. Um, but anyway, they go to The Shining because that's the movie that Warner Brothers has the rights to. Um, it's also more special effects heavy than like, I'm pretty sure in the movie they use, the, in the book they use like, I suppose War Games was a movie he has to like, yeah, there's a whole scene in the book where like uh, he has to recount the entire plot of War Games. Uh, line for line you see why i don't take this quest seriously yeah that was a, that was the thing in the holy grail you had to like uh you had to like reenact an entire like like greek play in order to get the holy grail remember that part when no, they uh, do Sir they do it more than once though they they oh yeah they do because they, they do the uh monty python 
Yep, they also do Michael. They, hold, they yeah. do a whole Monty Python movie. Yeah, they which I excessively like. That is very plausible that people could like recite the entire Monty Python. Less so War Games, but yeah, I believe there are definitely people who could recite the entirety of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Like that is I mean, definitely a thing. I, I'm just remembering the whole. I'm being oppressed like monologue about. Uh, uh, the lady in the water distributing the sword to King Arthur and making himself the uh, ruler of uh, all of England. All of Britain? Yeah, Britain. all of Britain. All of the Britons. The Britons. But yeah, so... But they don't quite do that in this movie because that would be uh, boring and stupid. And, and and I'll give it... Like, the book does go through a part, a bunch of parts where they just list off every detail, everything. But um, the move like they do uh for the most part just skim over that he just recites every line in the movie uh so they end up in the overlook hotel which is the place from the shining i think right wait you haven't seen it why am i asking you uh, you just said that you didn't see it so it's the overlook hotel are you sure about that though i'm reasonable overlook hotel uh, yep okay you are 100 percent correct yep all right yay Funny thing about this, they can't. They apparently didn't pay for uh, Jack Nicholson's face, so his character is not shown in this movie in this sequence at all. Uh, like we see him want like the back of uh, Jack Nicholson's leg, but they do not show Jack Nicholson's face. <laughs> the because face I cost guess, extras, but it, yeah, but the leg... you would have had to like pay Jack Nicholson, uh, which they weren't in the mood to do, I guess. Um, but I guess maybe they paid for the actress that, uh, or paid for the rights to the actress that did, uh, the naked lady from The Shining. Uh, but I don't, I don't imagine that yeah, costs as much. Because that's the only scene that lady And did I mean, like, there, there was the two young girls in the, yeah. in the hallway scene where they're like, come and play with me and stuff like that. I'm pretty sure those characters are both one-offs. I don't imagine it would cost them too much to pay those actors uh three actors or whatever Child if they even need to too. like they they, they, were, they were... if they even need to i don't know and what i mean the... you could always just, yeah recreate the scene i guess because like I, I don't think there's anything really like super distinguishable about those two girls no but anyway. I, don't, I don't even think i don't even think you fully see their face in that uh, in that scene no it's you see their face straight on the two girls yeah uh, I thought I thought it was blurred. Yeah. Kind of like the mm. grudge type thing going on. But no, not wrong. really. But yeah, they wander through this place. Um H like Cody hasn't seen The Shining. So H just wanders into all the traps in the movie. Like H wanders into the uh room where in The Shining Jack Nicholson wanders into this one room and there's a lady in the bath who crawls out to like seduce him. And then he looks in the mirror, and then the lady's a uh, monster lady, or like a uh, crone, I suppose is the word. Sure. And the, as like H is leaning in for a kiss, uh, because H is a lesbian. But yeah, that's a thing. Shoto finds the key off screen, and uh, they end up finding, uh, or a key off screen, and they end up finding uh, a paint. Uh, like a photograph which is like um in the shining there's a photograph uh, on the wall that shows like a bunch of people from a party and at the end of the movie jack nicholson is like photoshopped into that picture uh by the ghosts that haunt the overlook hotel because he's been his soul has been trapped by the overlook hotel or whatever and in this we see that it's uh holiday and kira in the photo so they figure that out and then they go to uh the club room in the overlook hotel i forget what they call it but they find a bunch of zombies dancing around and also kira's like being uh danced with by zombies so they figure they have to like make their way into uh the the building and uh and through these zombies that are floating above this chasm and like make their way over to kira and uh ask her to dance uh which 
Um, when Artemis comes to that conclusion, she jumps onto one of the people and is, uh, uh, in that sense, the other members of the five away. And she manages to make her way over, to jump her way over the zombies to Kira, asks her to dance. And uh, that solves the puzzle. And she gets the second key, the Jade key. So, so I actually have a question for you. Do yep. you think it, it, it's ethical, like, to go into one of these old-timey hotels and then, then, like, start taking down some of these pictures that they've had up for, like, 40, 50, 60 years of, like, staff who worked at the hotel and then just, like, photoshopping yourself into every single one of them? And then, like... <laughs> Because at one point in time, somebody's going to be looking through all these photos and they'd be like, this fucking guy's in every single one of these photos. How old is this guy? And then, like, you're going to get written off as a ghost or something. Um, I mean, that is sort of the premise. But, like, the sets from the Overlook Hotel, like, the insides of the Overlook Hotel are not, like, part of the physical hotel. Like, that is a set. They just, you, they have, like, a, a hotel yeah, they go like, to, but... There's yeah, they make a set for the interior of the place. But but what I'm saying is like, uh, I've seen diners do it where they've had like pictures of like people eating at the diners from like the 1950s or something onwards. What would happen if you would have just like taken all those photos down, uh, photoshopped yourself into a copy of them, and then just hung them back up in this diner? And then they'd be like, oh, for the last 50 years, this one random guy has been eating at the same table ever since in all of these photos every single day. I mean, I guess that would be spooky. And then they'd be like, it's a ghost. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Shining's an okay movie. I'm not the biggest fan. Uh, maybe I need to like get like up to date on the interpretation where it's uh somehow about um uh like something about like the expulsion of first nations people someone has a take about that but i've never watched like the thing that explains what the take is and maybe after i watch that the movie becomes good uh really good but it, it's just all right for me right now because i think this is also one of those movies where like yes, it's a hotel built on top of a uh first nations burial ground I think that's maybe one of the prim like that's a thing that's in the movie, even though it's one of those things where no yeah. First Nations people appear in the movie, despite the fact that like they're specifically the ones having their grave sites uh, disturbed. That's a weird plot point, actually. It's like one of those things where it's like uh, we're like the giant major like pushing point of certain movies, and like we're never like even included at all. Like there's no like cultural representation of like indigenous people or if they if there is they're like oh we need to bring in like this indigenous shaman to like come spirit walk in and and to check what's wrong with this house or something i don't know if that was a thing i'm pretty sure they brought in a a, a priest in the uh the exorcist no nope. and like that's and like there's certainly like a uh, poltergeist Oh yeah, Polter yeah, Poltergeist is the one where they do that too. But yeah, and it's not like there's a plot like out there about like um the like a bunch of white people reckoning with the wrath of some First Nations ghost. And there's some sort of like like effect you could get with that, but like no one seems to be using that to that effect, to my knowledge. I guess maybe the shining, but I haven't seen what the interpretation of that is. And there's no and there's no First Nations people in Doctor Sleep either, that I can remember. So that's another thing. So they don't like go on anyway. Moving on. This isn't the review of The Shining. Uh. So yeah. After that, they all manages to recover the keys. Uh. The rest of the high five, and then uh, the Sixers get it. They've also discovered that Wade is alive because he's advancing on the uh, scoreboard, but they obviously don't know where he is. So they have to uh, go track him down, which they do from finding the uh, highly recognizable guy they used to kidnap Wade, the resistance used to kidnap Wade earlier in the movie. Like, they yeah, could if not... Yeah, you're gonna, like, kidnap people, please, please don't have face tattoos. <laughs> like, Yeah, specifically what? a very specific face tattoo. Like, that's a whole thing. Oh, yeah, it wasn't even like it was, like, an intricate design. This guy's got, like, I don't even know, like, 
three half circles on his face. I think that that's probably the closest you're going to get to a description yeah. of it because I... like best you could say as it's like a gang. It's supposed to be like a gang tattoo, but like the Yakuza do that and they like hide those tattoos when they need to. Like, um, have you ever seen that the Yakuza where they'll have like a, like a full upper body tattoo that just like fits conveniently under a suit jacket? Have you ever seen those? Those are kind of nice. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, you've probably seen one at some point, just didn't know what it was. But yeah, the Yakuza will, like do like mm -hmm. full upper body tattoos that like they can they take you take it off their shirt and it's like, oh wow, that's a big fancy tattoo. But it also just like fits underneath a suit jacket or like a long sleeve shirt or whatever. So that like if they need to, they can just like go to a place and not have anyone like chat to him about it i i really like like mafia movies sometimes i think like public enemy or, or like some of the like gangster movies early on especially i really like and like the yakuza are, are are cool because they're like samurai gangsters and like i don't know why i don't ingest more Yakuza that media. in like my media diet at all. <laughs> like like well not even like like media but like just movies in general of like we can watch a Yakuza gangster movie. samurais like like we can like, schedule what? we can absolutely schedule a Yakuza we movie did, in season four. We There's haven't room. even done like a, a a samurai movie. Like I think the the like closest was probably that uh anime ninja movie we yeah. watched. Yeah, that was yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so yeah they through the highly identifiable guy who kidnapped wade they managed to locate wade uh so they managed to track them down through tro uh drones and these corporate police go to break break into this uh resistance headquarters and uh they arrest uh sam for having debt somehow i guess this woman like <laughs> has like ioi debt is this a thing or is it just like, transferred from her dad possible, earlier in the movie? I suppose. But I think it's indicated that it's transferred from her dad, which Could is be. like like that's the worst type of like fucking debt system in America, like where your kids have to suffer through your um, dad, yeah. Your shitty life choices and like, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know what the laws on that are. Maybe adding a little like I don't know what the laws well, are. Well, even on if it. there is laws on it, like, like if that's the case, then like IOI is like a shittier company than like we're led to believe. I mean, they're already all slavers, so like, yeah, like, yeah, no. Uh, anyway, so uh, Sam sacrifices herself so that Wade can get away, because Wade is the best hope for the universe i guess this wasn't a thing in the book this is like this act is like wildly the final act of the movie is like wildly changed from the book and there's like a lot of changes from the book already um but in the book um wade is the one who you who like he essentially makes up fake debt so that he can like get kidnapped by the corpo police so that he can infiltrate ioi and uh like use it to gain information because um as they're doing this ioi has found the third key and set up this uh, the orb from earlier in the movie and used it to create this incredible and impenetrable force shield now it works very differently from it did in the book the uh in the book it's like the bouncing factor it, it was a lot more plausible because the bouncing you got like this invincible shield that you could go over for so much range um, and the trade-off was that um, you could deploy this shield, but you couldn't move once you deployed it, which is a problem because eventually you need to like sleep or something or log off. But uh, for the Sixers, you can just like have someone else switch into that account uh, because it, it's been established in the book that uh, the Sixers have like modified rigs. So that they can like snap in whatever expert they need into whatever account they need at the time, which I guess doesn't count as cheating, but really who can confirm that for sure? 
I think that's speculation, but they are doing it. So yeah, that was the thing in the move in the book, but in the movie, it's uh, instead of uh, Wade getting abducted, it's uh, Ch- uh, Sam for more dubious reasons. But anyway, it's also uh, these um, indentured servant camps are a lot more brutal in the book. They like literally snap like uh, tags on you like a cow, like like literal ear piercings onto your ear so you can't like get away. And it's like a pretty cool corporate espionage scene that Wade does, which I think is more impressive. But the book movie's also all right, I guess. It's just different. Um, I guess this is done so that um, Artemis has more to do. But um, I didn't. here's the thing. I didn't think the book did a bad job with um, not balancing how much the side characters did in relation to Wade. I mean, it could do better obviously but uh i felt they did a fair amount i didn't feel like wade was doing everything like in the like for example with the second key uh wade like had like a significant amount of time before between artemis getting the jade key and him getting the jade's key so it was a whole thing but yeah and as wade's running away h finds him because h is also in columbus I guess in the book, she's from Detroit and she drove there. Also, she has Shoto and Daito with her. And it's revealed that Shoto is a kid. So that's a thing. So yeah, they got this whole setup. Uh, the Sixers are, have found the third key and have like surrounded them, locked themselves in with a uh, giant force field. Um, so they need to break open a force field and also save Sam. Uh, so what they do to get Sam out is um, because Wade knows everything about Sorrento's rig, including the password, they're able to like intercept Sorrento as he's logging out and uh, uh, manages to convince Sorrento that he's logged out when he really hasn't. So they uh, like trap him and threaten him to uh, figure out where, uh, where Artemis is. So they find Artemis inside the, uh, the Sixer war room and uh, let her out. Uh, but she manages, she stays in so that she can uh, mess with Sorrento further after he figures out that he's uh, not, he's still in a simulation and he gets out. So yeah, they have to, so Artemis lowers the shield so that uh, everyone can break in. But Wade has to, in the meantime, raise an army to take on the Sixers, uh, which is a little bit more plausible in the book because the uh like gunter armies had just been raised periodically throughout the book anyway so like having them show up at the end of the book wasn't like a big surprise it was just like um what wade did was just like say like hey we need you all here at this location at this time at this time and uh yeah that was a whole thing but uh yeah so they gather the army and we get our first uh big uh giant gunter versus sixer war as uh as uh, Sam manages to take down the shield through saying some magic words instead of just, like, killing the guy holding the shield ball up, uh, which is what they did in the book. Uh, which, whatever. That's a weird change. So, yeah, they break in. So, yeah, this war, this war happens over the song. Uh, we're not going to take it. They use some fake. They use some decent music throughout this movie. It's kind of fun. Wade drives in on his... Uh, DeLorean H comes in with a Iron Giant mech, uh, which is a thing they do because uh, this movie's waited by Warner Brothers and Warner Brothers owns Iron Giant. In the book, they used uh, Ultraman from Japan, uh, which I, also just like a less uh, I was trying to thing. figure out they, they used a lot of uh, the mechs in here. Because all of the, like, the high five each get their own mech, correct? Yeah, in the book, yeah. I'm just, I, I was trying to figure out which, uh, like, which character gets what. And, like, there was Leopard on. Oh, yeah, um, um Wade got Leopard on. And he got, um, uh, Ultraman was a thing he got from Dido because it was, like, Shoto's, uh, like, like, signature thing. And like Sh- Dido gave it to Shoto to Wade as like a gift after Shoto had been killed. 
And the reason they had actually, and this is another thing. And I forget the, all the yeah. other. And the reason that the high five had teamed up at that point, the high four actually had teamed up in the uh, book um, was not out of a sense of like teamwork or whatever, but because they figured out they needed the, they needed four guys to uh, open the final gate. So to get to the uh, crystal key or whatever. And yeah, that was a thing. So that's a notable change, but we've gone past that ship as the war rages. So, so, Sorrento, 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 uh, Sorrento puts himself inside a mega Godzilla and fights down the iron giant. And also, uh, Shoto goes into a, uh, Gundam and they managed to, uh, do mm -hmm. a lot of work, uh, with the help of Artemis also kill the mech Godzilla, which was a cool thing. It was kind of cool in the book too, but it was interesting. Artemis, uh, at, at, as they're making, as uh, the H goes down with the Iron Giant, which leaves Dido, Artemis, uh, yeah, H and uh, H and Shoto go down, defeating Mechagodzilla and the bank bounty hunter guy. So Artemis, Dido, and uh, Wade go breaking into the final boss, and they have to go through a whole squad of people which uh wade destroys with a holy hand grenade um he also kills artemis's uh sixer avatar so that they can uh so that she can just escape because they're they uh the sixers have figured out that she's in the war room and they're trying to track her down um and they manage to bluff her out of there by having her die and just pretending that she was one of the people that had been killed earlier and therefore not uh, Artemis. So Artemis just walks out of the uh, IOI a free woman. So that's a fun thing. They The final crystal key is uh, like uh, hidden behind a uh, Atari. What's the Atari? What's the one? 1600? 2600? 2600. The Atari 2600. Um, and they need yeah. to figure it's got like all the games that's plugged that's into it. And uh, they got a, and the Sixers have been trying to figure out what game uh, they need to play to uh, get to get the crystal key. Um, they eventually settle on adventure, but they don't manage to pull it off because uh, the secret is you need to play adventure and also go for the uh, Easter egg in adventure, um, which is a famous, which is uh, the first uh, known Easter egg in a video game where the creator of the game adventure hid his, uh, his uh, name in one of the secret rooms. So Wade ends up getting to, uh, has to go find that. But in the meet, but before he knew that, uh, Sorrento and the bounty hunter show up with a thing they had shown off earlier in the movie, which uh, essentially destroys, like, and essentially after a brief skirmish, destroys like kills every player in the in the uh area area like on the planet at, like some sort of like the nuke from the end of uh kill zone three um sure kill zone three ends with you and nuking an entire planet for those of you who don't uh know that um it's a pretty sweet thing uh but thank which uh would in theory uh guarantee uh, the Sixers a chance to finish the game because uh, they'll just send in reinforcements, whereas uh, everyone else has to like log in and like go to a spawn point and get like money to get to this place or whatever. But instead, uh, the coin from earlier in the movie turned out uh, that um, the librarian from the uh, the library from the journals uh, gave Wade was apparently a one up. So he survives the uh, explosion with uh, just like no real armor, just like uh, pants and a shirt. And he manages to beat event uh, get that Easter egg in an adventure and gets into uh, the final part where he gets the final key, uh, which he opens through some trouble. Uh, they are doing this in a moving van because uh, IOI has tried to track them down IRL and kill them. Uh, which they need to do now because it'll take them some time to get like another uh, some reinforcements there. 
Um, also, Wade's already in the room, so they need to, like, uh, stop him from completing everything. So, yeah, Wade's having some trouble with that um, while they're getting chased, which this is a... Honestly, this is the one big improvement over the book. In the book, uh, Og uh, invites all the the high four to his place to like finish the quest in um, like under his protection. But um, I like this better. It adds a little extra tension. I think that's probably a good move. I don't know how you uh, ship Dido in from Japan for this scene in the book version, but um, whatever. Um, I think it works pretty well in this. Uh, so he meets, so he opens the gate and uh, has a talk with uh, Halliday, who after a while gives him the Easter egg. Uh, he has to like do a thing where he refuses the uh, to sign some paperwork because it was reminiscent of when um, Halliday kicked Og out of the company, which is something he regretted. But yeah, then, but yeah, he uh, Wade ends up getting the egg after a little bit. Uh, just before, um, Sorrento barges into, uh, Wade's van personally and pulls a gun on him, uh, but points it downward because I guess he can't do it. Not even out of spite. This is a terrible part of the movie. Like, this is the one, like, before this seemed like a good change, but they ruined it with, uh, Sorrento's bit. Uh, because he just wanders into the stacks and like all the stacks people had been warned he was coming. So they, they like mob around him and he just holds up like a tiny little gun and the entire stacks just backs off, which I don't buy because <laughs> it's just the, he pulls out like a tiny nine millimeter and like easily like 120 people just like back off him. Like like you could charge that guy. I'm not saying like in oh, every yeah. scenario you, you can have him chart surrounded. Him. Yeah, you have him like, surrounded though. Oh yeah, absolutely. With such a small gun too. Like if I was one person and somebody pulls out a gun, yeah, I'm fucking off. <laughs> and he points it into the air, which is the other thing. He doesn't even convince yeah. it, like pointed it, like wave it around the people significantly fast. And like I'm not saying this is like mm -hmm. a scenario that applies to every. Like they could have easily just like given this guy like an AK, and it would have been a lot more plausible. Oh, yeah. But no, he just has like a kind of like peace. Just tackle shooter. the guy. No, he's very tackleable. Um, dangerous, of course, but um, people tackle shooters mm -hmm. occasionally. Like, it's not unheard of. Well, ex especially like if you go for the knees from behind, like, what's he going to oh, do? Yeah. Shoot the person in front of him? Like, you're not getting shot at that point. In Even then, like, like, somebody might take a bullet, but like. <laughs> Even then, like. People are remark like uh, people are more capable of taking a bullet than you think they are. I think. Yeah. Yeah, those stories are more common than you maybe think. Like legs and like torso, but like shoulders, arms. I don't. I like legs are specifically weird because there's there's a and lot again of... small gun. He, a small yeah. gun, you might be fine. Yeah. Like it's not the most like no gunshot is safe to take but um it's like not the worst gunshot in the world oh um, anyway so um wade has the egg and uh at this point the cops show up because it's sudden suddenly it, with uh 10 minutes left in a movie law enforcement exists yeah no ioi is allowed to like throw like death squads after people but uh, oh, the CEO himself want, waves a gun around, and suddenly that's illegal. Like, come on, I don't buy this for a second. If anything, the cops, if anything, those IOI corpos were like cops, actually. Like, it's just nonsense. And everyone just shows up to this trailer park that they've driven to, and uh, they call in. Uh, Wade decides he wants to share the money with the, the members of the High Five. So yeah, that's a whole thing. Uh, he, uh, Wade brings Og back into the fold of the, of, uh, Gregarious Games. We have a few things. Uh, Wade has a big red button that'll shut down the entire o Oasis if he wants it to, wants to. They've also, um, a thing they did, he explains that he does in, uh, the ending monologue is that, uh, banned all the, uh, accounts using these, uh, uh, indentured servants. 
which is good. So essentially they can't um, earn like these uh, this cryptocurrency that they use in game or game or whatever. So that's handy. I don't know that, that really solves the problem. I mean, I, they could probably get those guys to do something else. I, I don't think it actually fixes anything ultimately. Oh yeah, no. I think, uh, I think it just just the ends indentured servitude programs. I I, I still in, in terms of the like, within the oasis is what I'm saying. Like it ends it within the oasis exclusively. Yes, but it's not fixing the use of oasis as currency anymore. So you can still get a job within the Oasis and work in the Oasis. True. You can't go into yeah, debt maybe. by working a job within Of the course, Oasis. in the sequel, like, um, they essentially, essentially in the sequel, uh, what happens is, uh, Gregarious Games does some things to, like, take over IOI or, like, bankrupt it. So that's how they end up solving that problem. But again, it's like one mega corporation cannibalizing another. At that point, it's lukewarm success. And if uh, if they were pl if Ernest Klein was willing to play with that a bit more, it'd be one thing. But he's just not willing to play with that angle. Um, he's very much like this is about finding fancy Easter eggs and like met the metaverse, and that's what the whole thing is. Uh, they've also agreed to shut down the Oasis on Tuesday on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Which, uh, who fucking gives a shit? That means nothing. Because, like, this this book is insisting that, like, it's making some statement about Wade spending too much time in video games. But I don't know how. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of the movie. <laughs> like, two days out of your week, you're going to spend not playing video games. And, and that's going to... That, that, like, that's the follow-through of this. And people use the Oasis for other things. It's like a ch It's like a chat room for a bunch of people. Like, it's just going to inconvenience it's a, a lot of guys. for most people. Oh, yeah, that too. Like, no, yeah, this is just going to be a massive inconvenience for people. It's some people's job, for fuck's sake. Like, and, like, yeah, no, it's just, just going to work around. You're only, you're going to get these random, one, like, like, I do that sometimes. Like, my weekends are sometimes, like, Tuesday, Thursday, like, the odd time. But, like, yeah, it's, like, whatever. It's a way to do things, but... Like, don't get me wrong, I actually like, I like the work schedule that's like, um, you work for three days, you get a day off, then you work for three days. I like that quite a bit, actually. Like, that's, like, if I'm doing a five-day-a-week work week, that's how I prefer to do it. Um, honestly, like, a, a I don't five... like getting into the, like, the swing of things, and they're like, oh, you're gonna work Monday, and you have Tuesday off, and then you work Wednesday, and then... The... I, yeah. I, I don't feel that. I, I just, yeah. But again, I'm, this or is like just me. Six on, one off type of deal. Yeah. I'm saying like three on, one off, three on, one off, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Like that, that I like. But um, again, others won't. Like that's how I like to operate, but others don't. That's fine. But anyway, that's the movie. Yeah. Anything else you got to talk about? I don't think there's anything I haven't already said about when. Yeah. I've what'd you think of season three this. yeah what, what what are your thoughts on the like um, looking back on the season i mean all things considered it, it was fairly decent there was uh we covered definitely, like so many more like comic book movies that i wanted to oh, talk yeah. about but i felt like it, like as soon as we did uh like two or three comic book movies or like children's movies <laughs> took up a weird amount <laughs> of this season more than i thought it did we did like a dystopian theme uh, toward the end there with like the last five episodes or whatever, which was fun. We got all, we started putting stuff on YouTube, which is fun. Um, the sub theme, I think, was uh, fun to do. It was decently. It's different doing this uh, two days a week. It's sometimes hard to like I lose track of time and like get things like done too late in the month, which is weird. But I think we just got like thrown off track at some point and. Yeah, but like it, it's definitely probably more to do with the, like we got off schedule, but like I, I I think that's kind of just the way to go is one episode every two weeks. It gives you enough time to to go in and edit, edit and uh, stuff like that. So yeah, there's a 
like need for a change up in season four like we can talk about that at some other time yeah no um we did uh like i think um uh this was a season like one of the goals was to get you to pick like a good chunk of the movies how did you feel that went there was like once again it, like i've brought in up the watchmen so many times on this podcast like I, i'm surprised we didn't get around to doing that but there's like there's like a few different movies that like i'm like we should probably do that at some point in time like or even movies that are brought up on the podcast where it's like i should probably watch one of those because like i reference it yeah every once in a while and it's like why why do i not just sit down and watch it so i mean yeah one of my goals i haven't seen poltergeist in a few years get sit down and watch that again one of my goals for um by the time we get to episode 100 i want to have done like a like a movie from like every major film history decade and done a movie filmed on every continent or like made on every continent or like produced by people on every continent which i got I think we're pretty close on a couple we got, of those fronts. yeah we got africa and south america to do for uh like continents i think uh it depend like this is being pedantic but we if we can do we'll do something that's like uh filmed on the asian mainland uh sometime in the next one certainly uh we did a japan but uh i think that's just the thing we can do got like uh definitely s- some european stuff going on we only have, have one decade a Hollywood movie no we still need to do that um that could be that's a, definitely a thing we're, I and think like we'll, a kung we'll fu movie yep i think that's on it too like we said we were gonna do a kung fu movie this season and i'm like let's do dragon ball evolution so I but yeah and then we got to do a movie from the 1940s which we haven't done yet we've done a movie from uh, the podcast has done a movie from every decade from the 1920s onward. We could do something from 1910, but um, there's two things about that. It's A, silent films, exclusive, pretty well exclusively. I think entirely exclusively. Also, it's uh, like film production hasn't like super kicked up toward then. But we could also maybe do something from the 1910s yet. But we've done it, we've done one from every decade since then. Uh, from the 1920s uh the oldest film we've done is one i did with curtis was a uh, broadway melody which was a bad movie but yeah i think um one thing i might do is like uh title the videos a little bit differently going forward just keep an eye on that um viewer because i might just like do like uh uh like just like the movie and just like a two-word statement about it and we'll see how that goes but like keep an eye on that i know uh, i've lost track of channels that have done that before but just uh keep that out it'll still like record regularly but no it's not like a big change in content if you're waiting for that i think that's all it's getting sort of sorry i just got into a list of uh a list of uh 1940s movies and this does yeah, not look I, promising I, yeah i told you to pick something out for that too so that is your job like the Wolfman, like is probably the coolest thing I've seen so far. Yeah, we might and then do there's that. There's like uh, uh, George Steinbeck. I do you believe that's his name. Steinbeck novels. Yep. Um, yeah. John Steinbeck. Not yeah, George. John Steinbeck. John Steinbeck. Yeah. John. Yep. He did have uh, Crepes of Wrath and Of Mice and Men. But yeah, I don't know if there's any like I think I think we can nail down the last of like categories of film that need we need to do. Like, this is black and white era. Like, we've done a couple of oh, black true. and white movies. Oh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I don't know that there's too many. Like, um, by the end of, by the 100th episode, at the end of season four, I think we'll have done all, like, real big film categories. I don't know that there's too many, like, without getting, like, super specific that we haven't done. We've done a little bit of everything at that point. Or we will have done a little bit of everything at that point. But yeah, if, yeah. If, unless yeah, unless you guys think of something, we can you can always send us something on uh, Facebook or through the email or whatever. That if that's something we can do. Yeah, I think that's it. See you sometime in June for the start of season four to get like some awesome stuff going on. Uh, the first uh, we're probably doing um, do 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 
Fantastic Four for uh, like the Fantastic Four uh, TV pilot movie that like they made from the 90s uh, first. So that's probably the first episode of season four because it has four in it. Um, after that, we'll be doing Phase Four, which is a movie from 1974. I'll try to fit fours into the rest of the like as many as I can until I run out. But um, I'll do what I can. We've got some interesting stuff coming up. We'll maybe do a movie from the 1940s uh, as the third thing. We're going to keep fours and get fours going for a while. So four is the theme. Uh, there's not really a sub theme for the next season. Uh, it's very it's going to be very horror weighted. We'll still do other stuff, but it's going to be weighted horror. Uh, anyway, um, so yeah, see you guys in June. Have a nice day.